Good evening, class. Uh, this is my first time ever teaching online. I hope it goes well. I have my doubts. I like interaction. I'm trying to imagine your faces out in the audience. Uh, you know, maybe looking at your phone, sleeping, whatever. I got to try to wake you up. Uh, but here we go. Uh, it's Sunday evening. Uh, you know, UNT campus is closed, and uh, I'm going to make my attempt to give you my normal class uh, with my normal bad jokes and all of that. I couldn't get the music to work tonight, but here goes. Uh, we'll talk uh, chapter 18, shareholders' equity. And I'm going to follow the normal outline. I'm going to go through my lecture uh, using the slides. And uh, when that is done, we're going to come back and we'll work problems. Uh, like problems that uh, you would see on the exam. Don't, don't know what the exam is going to look like at this point. So equity is, that's a big deal. You know, we've been through, you're the, near the end of your intermediate accounting journey now. You've been through assets, liabilities, and now you're at the last part of the balance sheet, equity. And we're going to see some interesting pieces. Uh, we'll get into share-based uh, compensation and EPS. Uh, in a subsequent chapter, but this chapter is just kind of your core equity topics. Um, very similar to what you've seen in um, Accounting 2010, Principles of Accounting. This is going to be, uh, you know, maybe some nuances, a little more detailed here, but uh, uh, let's get started. Um, again, let's go back to, let's think about it as business people. I always ask you and ask people who worked for me in the past to think about things as a business person. So, um, Companies need financing, and uh, a lot of companies these days are going out and getting debt uh, because interest rates are so low. And so, uh, in fact, they're buying back shares and reducing equity, um, and so that their earnings per share is greater. We'll talk about that towards the end of the chapter. Uh, what's, uh, from the investor viewpoint, what's great about equity is now you have skin in the game. If the company, if you loan a company money, if you have a bond of a company and they use your money and they take off, they do tremendously well, um, they, they make tenfold what you gave them, all they've got to pay you back is, remember, bonds payable, that's that principal amount. They owe you nothing more. Uh, that's not true for equity. Equity holders, they've got skin in the game. They've given an investment because they believe in the company. Now, they have the greatest risk because bondholders will be paid first. But the equity holders, if the company takes off, if they take that money and it goes, it grows tenfold, uh, the equity holders will have their proportionate share of that. And that's why we'll talk about uh, retained earnings. The owners own the earnings of the company. Bondholders, no. Nobody else owns the earnings of the company. The bondhold, the equity holders on uh, the um, earnings of the business. So if you think about it, you know, we all know the uh, old uh, accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Well, if we take assets minus liabilities, that is what's left is owner's equity. So we, owners have the leftover piece after we take all the, uh, the uh, all the things we own as assets minus the claims against those assets that are liabilities. And so, we think about it, there's two, there's more than two, but there's two primary components of shareholders' equity. Uh, number one is the original paid-in capital amounts, the exact um, dollars or other assets. Sometimes, and we'll see in this chapter, uh, people can give buildings, they can give assets to companies, even services, we'll see like even like legal services uh, can be provided to a company, and instead of, in lieu of cash, uh, the uh, person providing those services or the building or the equipment, whatever, will get an ownership interest in the company. You don't see that with large uh, publicly held companies, but in a lot of smaller corporations, uh, that, could be, that could be quite typical. And so paid in capital, again, is the amount of money that has been given to the company or assets by investors, and that's the paid in capital. That is the primary piece of equity. Well, subsequently, the company's going to take that money and they're going to uh, in, in, invest in their operations and they're going to grow the business and they're going to report net income. Who has rights to net income? Nobody else. Not bondholders. Nobody else. The owners, they have the right to that earnings, right? And so 
the retained earnings is another piece of uh, equity, the second and the, uh, just as important as paid in capital. This amount of the earnings the company has made in all, over all time, minus any dividends that have been paid out to uh, owners. Dividends are not an expense of the company. I think a lot of people say revenues minus expenses or oh, minus dividends because that's a payment out. No, that's a return to our owners uh, who invested in the company. So dividends are a return on capital. So retained earnings equals uh, net income uh, minus uh, dividends. Here's an example of a, an equity presentation right from a, a balance sheet. And we see here, uh, we'll talk about there's preferred stock, common stock, and then additional paid in capital. These are the three elements that we'll see in this chapter that comprise paid in capital. Retained earnings, obviously the next piece. And then uh, we remember our old friend, we've seen this uh, in, uh, in pension accounting for sure, and we'll, we'll see it later in investments. There's this bucket where the FASB requires us to put uh, some things in this bucket that they do not want to hit the income statement, yet it needs to be reflected accurately in the balance sheet. And so uh, four, uh, three pieces here are the uh, net realized holding losses on investments, uh, unrealized loss on pensions, which we've seen that deferred loss on derivatives, and accumulated other comprehensive income. You'll see later in advanced accounting that translation adjustments, currency translation adjustments, are also usually in multi-global companies uh, a big piece of other comprehensive income. And then finally, treasury stock. These are shares of stock that the company has repurchased from the market, and that's a, a big deal these days. A lot of companies are buying back their shares, and we will uh, look at the accounting for that. So here you go, four components of shareholders' equity. Again, two primary paid in capital retained earnings, and then we have uh, treasury stock. That's a uh, purchases of our stock. Uh, it's a negative, so what kind of, is that a credit balance or debit balance treasury stock? And I wish you were here to answer that. That would be a debit balance because that is negative equity. That's a, uh, a, a reduction in equity when we buy our shares back. And then finally, accumulated other comprehensive income. Paid in capital, um, as we've said, amounts that have been invested uh, uh, by shareholders and they receive shares of stock and equity interest in the company. Uh, we're also gonna look at um, uh, share-based compensation activities here uh, later uh, in the later subsequent chapter and then retained earnings we've talked about and treasury stock uh, repurchase of shares. And here's the four uh, main components of what you'll see in AOCI, accumulated other comprehensive income, uh, you know, gains and losses, um, unrealized gains and losses of debt securities, chapter 12. We'll get that in the last module in this course. Uh, gains and losses from um, uh, the amendments uh, to our post-retirement benefit plans. Um, uh, gains and losses on derivatives, uh, which is an advanced accounting topic and foreign currency uh, translation adjustments. Again, another advanced topic uh, we'll not cover in this class. So, uh, if we think about AOCI, it's a bucket of all these things that the FASB did not want to hit uh, the income statement. As you remember in pension accounting, we may have significant adjustments uh, to the pension liability because of discount rate changes, uh, mortality table uh, changes, and it could be, uh, in, in my experience in my companies, hundreds of millions of millions of dollars uh, in a single point in time on December 31st when we remeasure that pension liability, yet doesn't hit the income statement. It would overwhelm the income statement, remember? And we smooth that into earnings over time. Well, the FASB got concerned that these are, these are true economic losses that, uh, uh, that are not showing up on the income statement. So the FASB required a new statement. It's called the other comprehensive statement of comprehensive income or other comprehensive income. And it starts uh, with net income, as you can see here on the chart here. But then we put everything that happened in accumulated other comprehensive income here and we get to this number, comprehensive income. Goal here for this statement is for investors to see the whole um, 
economic gains or losses uh, for a company beyond just what was in net income in giving more emphasis on these things that are hitting AOCI in equity. Now, I sat in a lot of earnings calls uh, at Linux. Uh, I, I sat right next to the CFO and the analysts are asking lots and lots of questions. And all the questions are on the net income and earnings per share. And uh, it's always funny to me as an accountant, I never heard over 11 years at Linux, and I guess this, this uh, pronouncement is probably about uh, we're about six or seven of the last 11 uh, of those years at, uh, at Linux. I never heard a single question on comprehensive income. I think uh, investors did look at the pension liability of the balance sheet and understood that. But again, personal opinion, not a lot of focus on this other comprehensive income. But it is a required statement and uh, certainly uh, something that you would have to know for the CPA exam. So what kind of rights to um, do... Um, uh, owners of the company have. Uh, number one, uh, a right to vote. And so uh, if I own one share uh, of common stock of ExxonMobil, for example, I get to vote my one share. If I own 500 shares, I get 500 votes. Now, I, I don't know ExxonMobil. I think there's probably 100 million or more shares outstanding. And so my five votes are not going to really matter a lot. Now, if I own 20, 30% of the company, you know, be nice, uh, then my votes might count. And so you see mutual fund uh, companies own large blocks of shares, and they um, will vote those shares uh, in looking at good corporate governance or issues, uh, takeholder, uh, activist uh, uh, stock, activist guys will come in and, and buy uh, even 10% of the company, and they have a right to ability to influence that company with those votes and try to get uh, board seats and maybe even change the direction of the company. So the right to vote is, is a big deal. Um, again, what do owners care about? Earnings. Earnings. They want the company to make a lot of money. And when the company makes a lot of money, they will, not all companies pay, and they don't have to pay, unlike interest for bonds, they will pay dividends. And uh, a lot of investors, uh, I am certainly one of them, I like companies who pay dividends. And I can look at uh, a dividend divided by the stock price, not to be tested, is called, uh, in this course, is called dividend yield. And so right now, with, uh, uh, earning, with interest rates so low, the treasury is like less than 1%, it dropped down to like 0.4% uh, interest last week, but yet there's companies, uh, ExxonMobil last week had a, their dividend was paying out at 9, 10% because their stock took a big tumble. Now, I, I bought ExxonMobil stock last week because I'm looking for that dividend. The risk is Exxon, if they have a cash crunch, and that could potentially happen with everything going on in the world, they may not pay that dividend and that would certainly be an issue uh, for me, you know, but, uh, and, uh, and hit the stock price. And then finally, if the company liquidated uh, the, uh, the shareholders have a right to the distribution of the assets. Uh, bondholders are first in line. Uh, you would hope it, all the liabilities go down the whole liability. It's certainly salaries payable. Employees are going to be first in line if a company goes bankrupt. But their in line will be the uh, common, uh, common stockholders in the distribution of assets if there are any assets left over. And then finally, there's what's called the preemptive right. And that, that is a right to maintain my percent ownership. So if I own 10% of a company and I have preemptive right, if that company issues more shares, I have a right to go and buy 10% um, of those new shares. And so uh, that, that is an uh, interesting uh, piece. And so preferred shares, and they're, they're called preferred for two reasons. They have two big preferences. Number one, if there is a distribution of assets, uh, such as in a bankruptcy, preferred shareholders stand in line in front of the common stockholders. They're gonna be behind the bondholders, uh, but they're gonna be in front of the common stockholders and they will have a right to uh, their par value, the preferred shares first, and then if there's anything remaining, then the common stockholders uh, would take uh, that piece. And then uh, the big one here, uh, is the preference for dividends. Uh, preferred shareholders must be paid their dividend first 
before common stockholders uh, will be paid their dividend. And we're going to see that preferred shareholders, they have a uh, prescribed dividend, which is the par value times a percent. So it's almost like, like a bond in the way it plays out. And so if I had a $100 par value preferred stock, 5% preferred stock, then I would get a dividend of $100 times 5%, $5. So I'd be, I'd be guaranteed a dividend of $5 if they paid a dividend. And so um, we'll see if it's a cumulative, and most preferred stock is going to be cumulative, uh, which I'm looking here, that um, that uh, if the company does not pay that preferred stock, let's go back to my example where the preferred stock had a $5 dividend. If for some reason for three years, the company never paid their preferred dividends, then uh, before they would ever pay $1 to the common stockholders, they would have to take three years times that $5, they'd have to uh, declare and um, provide a $15 dividend to their preferred shareholders before they paid their uh, common stockholders. And then um, participating um, uh, would allow preferred shareholders to receive dividends beyond. But I want you to think mostly about this cumulative, and I want you to consider all preferred shares cumulative. We're gonna look at some dividend calculations, and you'll have to do uh, some dividend calculations uh, where preferred stockholders have to be made whole. So, and here's a good term here, dividends in arrears. So if a company does not pay a preferred stock dividend for a couple of years, we'll say that company is in arrears for two years on paying those dividends. And they have to catch up all those prior dividends for prior years before they pay one dime to their common stockholders. And so, kind of an interesting question. Um, preferred stock, is it equity or is it debt? Because the dividend is prescribed. The only difference is it doesn't have to be paid, but there's a catch up, a cumulative piece. And so, preferred stockholders is uh, sometimes considered kind of a tweener in between debt and equity. Uh, none of the companies that, that I've worked for had preferred dividends. I have owned uh, preferred stock before, and mostly I think you see this in financial services companies. A lot of banks will have preferred shares that kind of uh, is another way of shoring up their capital base. And uh, investors like it because they know how much they're going to be paid. Now, every stock uh, will have, you know, generally, like 99% of the stocks that I know, will have a par value associated with it. And I think in the, in the old days, not now, that par value has some real legal meaning, and therefore that par value is going to be a very small amount. Um, I think where I worked at Linux, the par value was only one penny, even though the shares uh, were trading over $200. Uh, when I left there, the, the par value of each share was only one penny. So you'll see five cents, one dollar, you'll see par value. And we're going to care about that. Legally, we have to account for the paid-in capital, the portion that is related to the par value. So when we see uh, our, our journal entries for this, we're going to really care about the par value. Uh, but again, not really sure there's a lot of uh, important things. And, and here you go. Here's the journal entries. Uh, Dow sold 100,000 shares, uh, $1 par value, and, uh, and they sold them for $10 a share. And so here's the journal entry. We're going to debit the uh, uh, cash, obviously. We received cash of $1,000. And we're going to credit the common stock account for the number of shares that issues, 100,000, times the par value, $1. So in a common stock account, the only thing we put in that common stock account is uh, shares that have been sold times the par value. And so you see here, $100,000 here in common stock, representing 100,000 shares at a dollar par value. However, the company received 1,000. So we got to do something with that remaining uh, $900, and we put it in uh, paid in capital, excessive par. Sometimes you'll see this called additional uh, paid in capital. Uh, a lot of times we just say APIC, you know, uh, for short there, APIC, uh, additional paid in capital. If their shares are no par, then we just put the whole amount in cash. We do not have an, an additional paid-in capital account. Again, not, uh, not very common. Most uh, shares 
uh, will have some type of par value in, in large global companies. Um, again, shares may be issued for other assets. The company may receive a building, land, equipment, legal services, whatever. And uh, we're going to debit an asset, or if it's a legal service or something like that, we're going to debit a, an expense for that. And then we're going to do this on the right side. We're going to credit how many ever shares we gave for that service, for that property. We're going to do the same thing. Credit common stock for the par value times the number of shares issued in additional paid in capital. The question here is, how much, what is the debit? How much is that debit? And so we look at the fair value of what we received. And if we can't do that, we'll go out and get an independent appraisal. But you can look at, hey, I know these shares were worth X amount per share, and we gave them um, a number of shares. We can use that if we know those shares have a market value, we know that what we received must have been a, a negotiated exchange uh, of services or equipment for that, we can use the, um, the market price of the shares. Um, or, you know, how much would we have paid in cash for those services or for that asset. So just keep in mind, we're going to debit an asset for the fair value of that asset, and then on the right side, we're going to credit common stock here, and there's a good example. Uh, issued one million shares, one dollar power value, for a custom built factory. The factory was worth ten million dollars, and so we had a fair value. We knew that was a fair value of that is ten million. And so here, there were again uh, one million shares times one dollar. So this is an easy math here. One million in the common stock account. The only thing that ever goes in the common stock account are the number of shares times the par value. So you can look at a common stock any any point in time. If you know the par value, you can just take, hey, here's my common stock account divided by the par value. We'll know how many shares have been issued. And then the remainder goes into paid in capital excessive par. Okay, share buybacks. This is uh, a phenomenon now, right now. Companies have spent trillions and trillions of dollars buying their own shares back. Uh, where I worked at Linux, uh, the, the CEO was, we started with no debt at Linux and we ended up with over a billion dollars in debt. All of it, uh, most all of it was used to buy shares back. And so uh, Linux started with about 55 million shares. I think when I ended, there was something like 40 million shares. So they bought 15 million shares back over the time that, that I worked at Linux. And that's not uh, just Linux, that is almost every publicly traded company they're buying shares back. You know why, why? Uh, I could be a little cynical that uh, uh, CEOs are paid as we're gonna see in share, they're paid in shares. And so uh, that share price, if that share price rises, they get higher compensation, obviously, uh, shareholders, <laughs> they win too, the higher share price. So if we reduce the number of shares outstanding, then um, we look at earnings per share, which we're going to study later, earnings per share will go up. And if there's a certain kind of multiple on that stock, then the stock price will also go up. And it also gives investors confidence when they see companies have enough confidence to go out and spend a hundred, two hundred, three hundred million dollars buying their own shares back, they're also making a statement, hey, these shares are a low price, and so I'm going to buy these shares uh, for the company. And we're going to have to look at the accounting for this uh, here, um, and so um, a lot of different reasons here. So uh, shares might be required to do a stock dividend. Uh, they might be required if we're going to do a uh, proposed merger. Uh, or defense against a hostile takeover, a lot of different reasons. Um, I'm a little more cynical since so many CEOs are now uh, just so invested in buying their shares back. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, share-based compensation. You see just a tremendous increase in stock price of a lot of companies too, so shareholders have won here to this. And so two ways that shares can be formally retired, just, you know, uh, uh, the problem with formally retiring them is they're not easy to reissue. If you call them treasury stock, this is kind of a legal designation here, treasury stock, uh, 
And it means I'm just buying them on a temporary basis. Temporary might be 25 years or 30 years, but I'm buying them back. So if I need for some reason to reissue these shares, I've, hold, I've held them in treasury, I can reissue them without going through all the gyrations of all, all of the uh, SEC uh, filings and everything else that would require to issue new shares. It's that we can hold them back in treasury stock. I believe most companies do hold them back in, in treasury stock. So here's a, at a company that reacquired 1 million shares. And so they had 100 million shares outstanding at a $1 par value. There, look at that, $100 million sitting in that, goes $1 times 100 million, and they got 900 million in paid in capital. They had uh, some uh, 2 million paid in capital share repurchased, and um, Two billion dollars sitting in retained earnings. So the company has, has made a lot of money, and now uh, they're buying a million of their shares back. And so let's look at uh, the two ways these journal entries would play out. Uh, in retirement, we would um, eliminate them on a prorated basis. Uh, we would uh, reduce uh, by common stock account by one million because uh, one million shares times a par value of a dollar, one million. And then the $9 came from the $900 million there divided by $100 million, uh, nine. And then, uh, but we, uh, and then paid in capital three uh, for the difference and the cash of seven, that we repurchased them at $7 per share. Hey, the treasury stock method is easy. And what you're gonna be tested on is the treasury stock method. I call this the easy entry. It's so, e it's so easy. A lot of people miss it on the exam. It's just debit cash, uh, I mean, debit treasury stock credit cash. So if you paid, uh, you, you repurchased 1 million shares times $7 a share, I had to pay 7 million, and I just put that exact amount in treasury stock. Again, I call that the easy entry. That's the one that I'm gonna hold you accountable for in this class. We're gonna put shares uh, that we reacquire into treasury stock. So I'm gonna skip by the retirement here. And uh, here, um, uh, the shares are repurchased at $13 per share, uh, a million shares, uh, the credit cash for 13, debit treasury stock for 13. Again, the easy entry. Whatever we pay out in cash, that's the amount we put uh, as a debit into the treasury stock. Remember, debit and treasury stock uh, because credits increase equity, debits reduce equity. So treasury stock is a reduction in equity and will be a, a debit balance. Now, it's viewed as a temporary reduction because we're holding it in treasury, means we may reissue it. By the way, a lot of companies, what they do with treasury stock and the companies I work for did this, they use, they paid uh, share-based compensation out of treasury shares. And so they didn't have to go out and uh, buy shares in the marketplace and give them to executives. They just pulled them out of the treasury stock and, and gave it to uh, um, investments. And so it's, uh, we're gonna debit the treasury stock account. Uh, and, and this is very important here, this, this line right here. Shares are still considered to be issued, but not outstanding. And so that's another term that I want you to think about here. Shares issued, those are the shares that we receive cash or assets for, and they're sitting in the common stock account. So those shares are still sitting in the common stock account, but we have this new account, treasury stock, that's a reduction. And so if we go back to this company here, uh, they had 100 million shares uh, issued in the common stock account. They reacquired a million, and so they would have issued 100 million shares but outstanding is only 99 million. So outstanding issued minus repurchased in treasury stock, that equals outstanding shares. And uh, shares could be issued, but not outstanding. Why does the word outstanding matter so much? And why am I emphasizing it here? Because uh, the company cannot vote treasury shares. If they could, the management's going to uh, take over and, and vote all their treasury shares, which could be uh, lead to decisions that are not right for the people that own the shares remotely that are not involved in the company. So the company cannot vote treasury shares. Also, the company can't pay dividends to itself, right? 
And so those treasury shares don't receive dividends. So when we think about outstanding stock, we care in terms of number one, calculating earnings per share, two, voting, three, payment of dividends. We only pay dividends to shares that are outstanding. So I, that's why I focus on this share. And so um, now we're gonna go, uh, let's look at the next piece of this. We're gonna resell some of these shares. And so um, the company, you know, bought shares back and now they're gonna resell it. This is where the accounting becomes a little bit more complicated. Not super complicated, uh, but a little more complicated. And so there's two, and again, I'm gonna skip the retirement. I'm not gonna hold you accountable for the retirement, so don't worry about that. Let's look here at the treasury stock. Remember that um, we bought these shares for $13 a share. So we have to remember that. Remember, we just debited cash, I mean, debited treasury stock for 13 million, credited treasury stock for 30. That was the easy entry. We had to go back and remember, oh gosh, how much did we buy those for? And so we take them out of treasury stock at exact, it's, a, it's a kind of like inventory, right? Uh, how you handle inventory transfer. We, we put them in treasury stock at $13. We take them out at 13. However, we sold them for $14 a share. So it's like, hey, we made money. Like we made a profit. Here's the problem. You cannot record a profit on selling your own shares of stock. And so therefore, we just take that extra uh, $1 million and we put it in paid in capital. So here, the company uh, sold the whole million shares uh, and they, re they received cash of 14 million. We take the treasury stock out at 13, what we originally paid for, and there's a, a million left over, um, a gain really, and so it's a credit into paid in capital. It's a good guy. It's good news for equity, right? Because a credit increases equity. So this was uh, in a good transaction for the company. They bought the shares at 13 and they later sold them 14. So uh, it was a good increase in paid in capital for the company. But it had nothing to do with earnings, right? And so therefore, we're not gonna go throw that in the net income. This was nothing about uh, running the business. Now here, here's a case where, um, yeah, we sold a million, uh, we, we acquired the shares for $13, um, but guess what? This time we're only gonna sell them for 10. It's at a loss, right? And so we have to think a little bit differently about it. Um, we've gotta take out, um, uh, we only received 10. We pull uh, this 13 out, and um, we had put this two in earlier. Um, it was in paid in capital. Remember, we put two there. We're gonna pull that back out, and um, uh, I think this is another example. Anything that we had in paid in capital, we're gonna pull back out. In this case, you don't see the whole, uh, the whole issue here. And what's left over, we put in retained earnings, a reduction to retained earnings. And we'll work some examples, like we'll work some problems. You'll see this uh, more clear. So, uh, yes, retained earnings could have a debit balance. Why would retained earnings have a debit balance? Because you cannot legally uh, in most states, you cannot uh, pay dividends if you don't have retained earnings. So you cannot take uh, retained earnings to a debit balance with uh, more dividends than you had net income. Here's the issue. If you see a debit balance, most the company had losses. And so uh, if the company has losses, we're going to um, debit retained earnings for a loss. If they had more losses, the net income, retained earnings could sit there with a deficit balance. And uh, if you look at retained earnings, there's some, some things in finance we call a Z-score, which is predictor of bankruptcy. One of the things a Z-score looks at is the balance that's in retained earnings, because retained earnings represents all the company has, uh, earnings the company has made over time, less dividends paid out. And so, uh, obviously, if it's a credit balance, means um, that we've had more net income uh, then we paid out in dividends. And so, you know, I like to use Amazon as an example. Uh, when I think about retained earnings because Amazon has never, ever paid a dividend. 
Uh, you know, they retained all their earnings, and it was good for shareholders that they didn't pay a dividend. Keep in mind, you go way back in time, way before your time, uh, but not before mine. I remember when they just uh, sold uh, CDs. That was Amazon. They sold CDs. They made money selling CDs. They kept all that money, and they started selling books. So books and CDs makes easy, right? It makes sense because it's all small stuff, right? And they seem like, oh yeah, I can see why they'd move into books. Uh, well, they didn't stop with books and CDs. Now there's almost nothing that you cannot buy on Amazon. And so they just kept, retained all their earnings uh, so they continued to grow the business. And uh, the stock price has gone up probably thousands of times. And so the shareholders won with capital gains, meaning their stock price went up even though Amazon has never paid a dividend. And so in, in a high growth company, you prefer, hey, don't pay me a dividend. Keep, you, keep growing, keep, keep, um, keep going, you're doing it great, expand. Uh, if you're a great restaurant, you're a shareholder, uh, you uh, have equity in that restaurant, uh, and they're doing great, they're making money, hey, don't pay me a dividend. Go build another restaurant, maybe expand uh, throughout the state, maybe throughout the country, maybe uh, throughout the world. Think about Chili's, started right here in Texas, and there's Chili's on every corner now. Just a great concept. Uh, chilies. Uh, people love to eat at Chili's. I love to eat at Chili's. And so, uh, so that's, a, that's an up there. So a company will retain, and retained earnings matters. So let's look at um, uh, dividends. So we're going to look at it more closely because you're going to have to understand how to do uh, the journal entries for dividends. And for dividends, there's three very important dates. Um, and we'll, we're going to get it into a minute uh, here. But number first date, is de de declaration date. Let's see if we're going to get uh, into this. I probably skipped somebody. The dividends are going to declare a dividend. So where I worked at Linux, uh, the board of directors got together once every quarter. We proposed a dividend amount. The, the board asked lots of questions of us. Of, you know, um, can we afford to pay this dividend? Uh, especially if we want to increase it. They said, God, we're going to have to decrease it later. A lot of kind of hard questions the board will give the management team when they propose paying a dividend. But uh, once the board agrees and approves that, they declare a dividend. Now, here's the issue. Companies, they don't have to pay dividends, right? I've said that so many times here in this course. Uh, so that's optional. Well, it's optional up until you declare. So after you declare a dividend, you can't say, oh, oh gosh, I changed my mind. I want to undeclare that. No. That's why the board spends a lot of time talking to the management team. And so immediately, uh, we're sitting there with a press release written up, and the board declare a dividend. The treasurer would run out of that meeting and, and give it to investor relationships, uh, relations, and we would uh, put a public announcement out, hey, Linux declares a dividend. And so you'll see these press releases from all large global companies uh, when they declare a dividend. But because you cannot undeclare it, even though we haven't paid it yet, now we have a liability. And so we have this new liability called dividends payable. So we're going to debit retained earnings, right? A reduction in retained earnings, and we're going to credit um, a dividend payable, and that is on the, the declaration date. Uh, we'll get into some other dates here in a minute, and so a liability is recorded. And uh, the second date is called the record date, date of record. And that's usually two to three weeks after uh, the declaration date. You know why? It takes time. We've got to figure out who to pay. Okay, you know, in the ExxonMobil example, uh, 100 million shares, we've got to find out ExxonMobil doesn't know who those 100 million shares are owned by. Uh, we have to go out in the market, and uh, there's people that help you figure this out. And we got to figure out who and where are they so we can um, mail them a dividend check uh, you know, later. Uh, so the date of record is uh, everybody uh, who owns a stock on the date of record will be paid a dividend. Now, there's this other little thing called the ex-dividend day which is two days before the data record, and that just helps, uh, helps the market uh, kind of, so you'll see X dividend day, um, you'll see that a lot. So you, if you, you wouldn't want to, if you're looking to receive this dividend, you would not want to sell the stock uh, one day before the X dividend date. 
Guess what? Let the date of record, the ex-dividend date pass, and you sell the stock. You still get the dividend because you owned it on the record date. So you think there's, a, there's no liability uh, uh, from the record date. No, there's no financial transaction from the record date. The only thing that's happening is I got a list of shareholders that I'll pay on what date? The payment date. That's the third date. And so on the date of record, there is no journal entry. And then finally, on the payment date, we will credit cash and, and uh, reduce the dividend payable. So on the declaration date, we set up uh, debit to retained earnings and we credit the dividend payable because we cannot back out of it at that point in time. No entry on the ex-dividend date, no entry on the record date, but on the payment date, obviously, credit cash, we're paying it, and uh, debit the dividends payable. Okay, let's talk uh, preferred stock here, uh, you know, for a minute. And, and I'm, I'm going to stop the uh, stop the video here, and uh, I'll, we'll end this uh, with the next class. Thank you, guys.